afternoon. Next week, the speaker is an entrepreneur from Romania who is going to describe the startup that we started here in that space. Dealing with 3D. Today I have a distinct pleasure of introducing you to Cooper Cantini from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He's going to tell us about hackers. So let's welcome the speaker. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Levine. I appreciate being here. This is my third time here. And I think I'm going to soon have to give it up to another coworker. So I'm a little sad about that. But I'll uh, try to make this talk um, a good one. So uh, as Levine said, my name is Cooper Clinton. Um, and I am here from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, and I'm a staff technologist there, which means I'm a programmer, activist, um, and, and things like that. Uh, who here has heard of the Electronic Frontier Foundation? Okay, a couple of you, great. So uh, it'll be beneficial for me to explain what we do. So we're a nonprofit that's been around for 25 years. Um, and our mission is to make sure that when you get on the internet, your rights come with you. So we think that the Constitution and things like inalienable rights, like freedom of speech, freedom of privacy, etc., all apply on the internet as well. Um, and so to do this, we have a number of tactics. We do a lot of legal work, which is perhaps what we're most famous for, and it's what we've been doing the longest. Um, for example, our Coders Rights Project um, attempts to make sure that security researchers don't get in trouble for doing the work that they do, and uh, helps protect them when they do get in trouble. We also fight draconian <laughs> laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is used to unduly punish hackers with extreme sentences. Um, we also have a activism component to our work. Uh, this is a blimp that we flew over the NSA data center in Utah. Uh, we flew this in conjunction with Greenpeace. It's their blimp. We don't have a blimp. Um, but it has a big sign on it that you can see says NSA legal spying below. Uh, this was a great action. I volunteered to learn how to be a F EFF's official blimp driver. Nobody took me up on it. Oh well. Um, and we have a technology component as well. Uh, so CertBot is one of our bigger technology projects right now, along with Let's Encrypt, offering free SSL certificates to encrypt connections to websites uh, wherever possible. And our goal is to encrypt every website on the planet. Uh, CertBot is the client for this, which helps you generate and install a certificate on your system and make it as painless as possible. As of at last count, I want to say we had over 5 million certificates issued so far in uh, about the, the roughly year that CertBot has been around. Mm. Uh, and we're now, the, by some measures, the second largest certificate provider in the world. So that's what EFF does, uh, in addition to a number of other things. And then there's some literature that I try to hand around and stickers and stuff. But I'm not here today to talk to you about EFF. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about the military industrial complex and what it is and why I think that you should not work for it and why you might be tempted to. So who here has heard the term military industrial complex before? Yeah, okay, we're in Sonoma. You, a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, old hippies right here. So this guy, definitely not a hippie. All right. Um, does anyone know who this is? Eisenhower. Yeah, this is Eisenhower. So this Dwight Eisenhower, uh, <coughs> former president, two-term president from 1953 to 1961, Supreme Allied Commander in World War II, voted Gallup's most admired man 12 times, built the National Interstate Highway System, established NASA, did a lot of things, and clearly not a hippie. Um, so a lot of people well, some of you have maybe heard or heard of his often forgotten departing address. And I want to quote it directly here. We can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We've been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. This conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. 
Total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of federal government. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this com combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. So what he's talking about there is the large focus of the government on military, on war, right? Um, and not many people know this, the Department of Defense used to be called the Department of War. Uh, that was a bad look, and so they changed the name to Department of Defense. But what he's talking about is, is the threat that a government so preoccupied with war and so entrenched with war and with the industry of war might be a threat to democracy um, if democracy is not the government's primary mission. So what kind of organizations are we talking about when we talk about the military industrial complex? Obviously military organizations such as the NSA who, and these are organizations specifically which might apply to hackers, right? How does this military industrial complex apply to us? Uh, United States Cyber Command, which is underneath the Air Force, which is responsible for cyber warfare operations and cyber defense operations. Uh, the FBI Cyber Division, which is responsible for law enforcement within the US, right? And then also companies, uh, defense contractors like Lockheed Martin, are employing more and more hackers to do offensive and defensive um, cyber, <coughs> to build their offensive and defensive cyber capabilities, right? Companies like Palantir, which are private, Palantir specifically is a private intelligence company, which uh, has a history <coughs> of helping the CIA and the NSA organize and graph the vast amounts of data that they're collecting, and this is Palantir's main job. Uh, fun fact, the founder and former CEO of Palantir, Peter Thiel, is now on Donald Trump's advisory council. So this is a company that is certainly squarely within the military industrial complex. And companies like Hacking Team. Uh, Hacking Team was a hacker for hire company that sold, or actually they weren't a hacker for hire company. Uh, they were a, they sold surveillance software and what, what they call lawful intercept software to governments to spy on people within their countries or people within their diaspora that lived outside of their countries. Typically uh, dissidents, human rights lawyers, etc. Hacking team was famously hacked themselves uh, by a hacker known as Phineas Fisher and uh, had their entire email spool released to the internet, which was quite embarrassing and showed that they had actually been selling to a number of um, autocratic and de despotic regimes. So these are all the sorts of companies that I'm talking about when I talk about the military industrial complex. But let's digress for a moment and talk about hacking. So I'm a hacker um, and I grew up as a hacker, right? I did some things in high school, which we shouldn't talk about, but offensive hacking is really fun. Uh, hacking is really fun. Security work is really fun, right? I grew up inspired by this movie, Hackers, right? You guys might be more inspired by um, Mr. Robot, F Society, right? It's a really cool romantic thing, and it's fun work. You get to solve fun puzzles, right? There's an element of danger. You might get caught. Right? There's an element of outsmarting other really smart people. There are a lot of reasons that offensive hacking is really fun. Unfortunately, if you get caught hacking, you go to jail. Uh, and you know, back to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, right? even if you're not trying to commit harm, 
there are such stiff penalties for getting caught doing unpermitted offensive hacking that it's not really worth it when you make those trade-offs, right? So what might you do instead? Well, if you want to offensively hack, right, if you want to hack into systems and you want to be able to do that legally, you might think that your only, your only option is to be a government hacker, right? And that doesn't really look like F Society or uh, the movie Hackers. It looks more like these guys sitting in a cyber command room or, in my opinion, uh, a little bit like Evil Corp, right? Um, but this is perhaps a way that you could offensively hack and still be on the side of the law because the government having a monopoly on violence is the only entity that's allowed to break the laws for its own good. But why, despite this, right? So I want to offensively hack. Okay, I guess I have to go work for the government. But this might not actually be a great idea. And I want to point out some reasons why that might be. First and foremost, meet your new boss. If you're working for the military industrial complex, if you're working for the military certainly, and to a lesser degree if you're working for military contractors, this is the chief, the commander in chief, if you will. This is who's going to be deciding what you will do. Now, I'm not here to be partisan, so I'll let you decide for yourself whether you think this might be a great idea or not. But I just want to remind you that that's your boss. The other problem with government hacking, though, is that you might not actually know what it is you're working on. A lot of offensive government hacking is focused on signals intelligence, right? A lot of the things we know from the National Security Administration and the uh, Tailored Access Operations Group, which is their offensive hacking wing, right? And what is signals intelligence actually used for? A lot of it is used for spying, right? And, you know, um, more like diplomatic intelligence. But more and more, it's used for deciding who to target with drones, right? Deciding who to target with military strikes. The things that you're working on as a hacker for the government might be five levels removed from what is actually happening with that information. And you'll never know that you, that phone that you hacked, the information that you found, was actually used to call a drone strike on somebody. And because of your hacking, somebody was killed. Another um, unfortunate thing about government hacking is bragging rights. One of the fun things about being a hacker is getting to go out and give talks and kind of talk about what you did. And this is the way that a lot of criminal hackers get caught. Right? Everybody wants to show off the cool elite hack that they did. Everybody wants to talk about how smart they are. God knows I'm no exception. And that's all really fun. Um, but if you work for the government or if you work for a government contractor, your work is going to be classified. And you're not really going to get to ever tell anybody about the cool, awesome work that you're doing. So, you know, if you have a big ego, this might also be a bad idea, right? Because I like to talk about the cool work that I'm doing. That's why I keep coming back here. Another problem with government hacking, and again, this is more related to the drone thing, is that you might be doing things that you morally disagree with, right? Uh, at EFF, we work a lot on spying, specifically the NSA's uh, warrant vast warrantless surveillance of American citizens, right? If you're a hacker working for the government or working for a government contractor, you might be complicit or you might help implement some of these types of programs, like the PRISM program, which was slurping up data from millions of Americans from uh, you know, almost a dozen online services, right? You might be complicit in violating the Constitution and not even know it and spying on your fellow Americans, right? And again, with what I had previously said about things being five levels removed, you might never even know that that's what you're doing because you're building one small part of that 
and not knowing that that's what's actually coming of your work, right? Um, Edward Snowden faced this, right, once he realized what the work was actually being used for and what was actually going on in the NSA. And he had then had to make a hard choice as to whether he could morally live with what was happening or whether his moral duty was to leak that information. And I'm glad that he did what he did, but I don't want to have to make that choice. So, a good reason to go work for the government, or a reason that is often stated is, well, I want to stop terrorism, I want to hunt down child predators, right? And these are all good and noble goals. Terrorists are obviously bad, child predators are obviously terrible. But you're probably not going to be doing that, right? And, well, whether you're stopping terrorism, that's maybe a very fine point, right? But that's not most of the jobs. Most of the jobs won't be under those ideal conditions of stopping terrorism or stopping child predators, right? You might be doing other things like spying on Americans or helping fire drone strikes, which you may or may not argue that helps stop terrorism, right? You might be um, surveilling people on the border or surveilling people for ICE to, to find targets for ICE to round up, right? You might, if you're working in industry, you might be selling to oppressive regimes or helping build the pieces of a surveillance state, right? You might be undermining democracy in our own country or in another country somewhere else in the world. So getting into the military industrial complex with the hope of fighting terrorism or child pornography is actually a gamble, right? You might not be doing that at all. And you might receive orders which you think are immoral. You might receive orders to help build out a surveillance capability to surveil the US. And to disobey those orders could mean jail, or it could mean, uh, well, it's most likely to mean imprisonment, right? Or exile. Or it means that you whistleblow, which also probably means imprisonment or exile. But protecting national security is important. And sure, that's, I don't argue that point. National security is definitely important. I'm a security researcher. I certainly think that security is important. But I think that there might be better ways to do that than joining the military industrial complex. You can find and fix vulnerabilities, right? A number of companies now have bug bounties, and finding and fixing vulnerabilities in websites is a good, in, in our national infrastructure, is a great way to protect national security. You can work for a computer emergency response team if you really want to work for the government. These are government organizations who are tasked with um, ensuring our Secu you know, information security infrastructure in our nation and dealing with that. Um, or you can write usable security software. Uh, and for example, uh, Signal is now being used, which is a uh, secure messaging application, is now being used by members of the federal government to secure their messages. So if you're really concerned about national security and other citizens as well who are also important to national security, right? So national security is certainly important, but there are better ways to do that, I think. But I want to talk about also some of the other cool things that you can do that will scratch that hacking itch, that will sort of meet the things that, for me, make hacking really fun, right? which are solving hard problems, going up against other smart adversaries, right? And even a little bit of risk. So in terms of <laughs> writing security software, as I mentioned before, this is something that EFF does, right? We have a couple of amazing projects to encrypt the web. Uh, CertBot, like I mentioned, HTTPS Everywhere, which is our browser add-on to upgrade your connection to a website to HTTPS whenever possible. Uh, and as a side note, we've now got more than 50% of the websites in the world encrypted, which is great. 
Uh, this is the first time that's ever happened. You can write other security software like Tor, which is uh, an anonymous web browser, which is used by people all over the world, including spies in our military, including dissidents in foreign countries, uh, people who are victims of abuse, students, people who want to journal or journalists, right? People who want to research uh, sensitive topics, right? Or people who want to circumvent censorship in their countries. And Signal, which I mentioned earlier, the um, secure messaging app for your phone. So those are the sorts of secure software that you can write that really do make a difference and can impact national security or can at least impact people's personal security. Uh, a project I did recently was going down to, so this is a photo from Standing Rock, North Dakota, where there was uh, recently a large uh, encampment uh, of people trying to stop a pipeline from being built through uh, Indian land and specifically through a river that was there, which they're concerned would leak into the river and damage the water supply for millions of people. Um, so we had heard uh, some reports of strange things going on on the ground there, specifically with communication and cellular communication. So I went out there to investigate the possibility of the police using an MC catcher, which is a fake cell tower which tricks your phone into connecting to it so that police can usually, it's usually used for location, uh, like to locate somebody. It could also be used to see who's in a particular area or get crowd numbers, right? Um, furthermore, they can be used to spy on people's <coughs> phone calls and text messages. So we were concerned about this possibility. <laughs> so me, some researchers from another university, and a couple of my other coworkers went down there to investigate the possibility of these being used. Uh, we did not find any evidence of MC catchers while we were there, which, I mean, I. I was a little disappointed about, but I guess I'm glad in the end that there was not that being used, or at least not being used while we were there. Um, we did f see a number of strange anomalies, though, including active man-in-the-middle attacks on networks down there, um, and just some events which were could have been could have been surveillance or police equipment related, could have also been related to the fact that technology is weird and it sucks. <laughs> um, but definitely some strange things going on down there. And so these are the sorts of cool things that you can do as a hacker. You can go places where people are facing oppression from their government or are facing strange technological issues and find out what's really going on. You can dig deeper and cut through a lot of the rumor and paranoia and misunderstanding. Yeah. So. Uh, do you do that legally when you check for the towers? Yes. Okay. And how do you? How are you able to do that legally? Um, Just like through your company, or? No, I mean, so it's there's no. I'm okay. I'm not a lawyer. Um, but your phone, your phone registers all of the towers around it all the time, and it's not like there are no FCC regulations against receiving, um, like receiving radio frequencies, okay. right? Maybe against decrypting them, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not a lawyer. But there's no decryption necessary to map out base stations because they send out packets to announce that they're there, like, a wi like the same way a Wi-Fi router does. Um, another project that I worked on was called Operation Mantle. Uh, this was me and my colleague, Eva Galperin, um, were, found some malware, which was targeting dissidents of the government of Kazakhstan. We call it Mantle because the Mantle is a cat which is native to the steppes of Kazakhstan. And it's a really amazing, <coughs> expressive cat. Uh, I don't have any slides of the cat here, but you gotta look it up. Um, so we found some malware which was targeting one of our clients who runs an independent, who runs Kazakhstan's only independent newspaper. Um, and we looked into the malware and found several more examples of it targeting other Kazakh dissidents, uh, including Kazakhstan's only opposition leader against Kazakhstan's first and only president. Um, 
And so we researched the malware, we took it apart. It turns out it was uh, some $20 off the shelf malware. Uh, the, the JRAT was the specific malware, if any of you were curious. Um, maybe George was. Um, and so we took the malware apart and we tracked, we traced it back to the command and control servers, which are the servers which distribute and control the malware. Um, and we looked around on those servers and found evidence of several more hacking campaigns against completely different targets. Uh, taking all of the evidence that we found, we were able to link this campaign with an Indian uh, company called Appin, which is presumed to be a hacker for hire company. They had been implicated in a previous attack on um, government officials of, I can't remember the government, and um, several banks and other uh, dissidents as well. So we were able to link this attack to Appen, and we were able to also link it through the fact that it only targeted Kazakh dissidents, and, or this specific attack only targeted Kazakh dissidents, and it targeted them with spear phishing emails, which were tailored to be of interest to somebody who was a dissident of the government of Kazakhstan. Uh, based on all of these things and based on some leaked documents which show that the government of Kazakhstan was trying to spy on this opposition politician in particular, we were able to link this back to the government of Kazakhstan. So that was a, this was definitely a fun project. Scratched a lot of my hacker itches, right? Um, we went up against a powerful, I mean, you know, the government of Kazakhstan is not the most powerful government in the world, but it is certainly more powerful than me. Right? And so this was a, a, it's a fun adversary to have, right? You get to scratch a lot of hacker itches, right? You don't want them to know you're researching their malware or their command and control servers, right? Um, and yes, it was all legal. <laughs> That's what the lawyers told me anyway. Um, but you get, to, you get to come up against an adversary, you get to solve fun puzzles, right? Reverse engineering malware is a great puzzle. Um, and you get to be stealthy. In a similar vein, uh, this is not a project I worked on, but the uh, organization Citizen Lab, which operates out of the Monk School of Global Affairs in Toronto, Canada. Uh, they have been researching government malware for several years now, and they're much better at this game than I am. Recently, they put out a report called The Million Dollar Dissident, where they had found three separate iPhone zero days, which were used to, uh, which were used in a spear phishing campaign to exploit this activist from the UA UAE, Ahmed Mansour, um, which were used to exploit his phone and install the spyware on his iPhone known as Pegasus. Um, now, I don't know if you know much about the um, zero day black market, but iPhone exploits go for about a million dollars a piece. So NSO Group, the company that um, did this exploit, or that performed this attack against him, NSO Group spent, well, and then whoever hired NSO Group, spent three million dollars to exploit this guy's iPhone. Normally, when dissidents get attacked by their governments, when governments try to hack dissidents, they don't spend $3 million, and they don't use zero days. They use $20 off the shelf rats and spear phishing. They still use spear phishing, but they also burned $3 million worth of zero days. Uh, Citizen Lab, working with the mobile security company Lookout, uh, were able to find the exploits, publish the exploits, publish the um, RAT, the remote access trojan that, they, that the company was trying to install, and completely burn all of that for NSO Group, and also expose NSO Group as a player in this vast spying industry. NSO Group is a great example of the industrial half of the military industrial complex, and the sorts of people you might be working for. Uh, like I said, <coughs> Mr. Mansour is a human rights activist uh, in the UAE, and so it's thought that probably the government of the UAE was the one who hired NSO Group because he hasn't pissed off many other governments and it's pretty much only governments that have enough money to buy three iPhone exploits. 
So this is another great example of the sort of fun work that you can do as a hacker and still scratch that hacking itch, right? You can go up against governments and still be legal, right? And I mean, nobody from Citizen Group should probably travel to the UAE anytime soon, <laughs> nor should I probably travel to Kazakhstan anytime soon. But I'm fairly confident that I won't be going to jail. And I'm fairly confident that nobody from Citizen Lab will either. Uh, this is Runa Sandvik from the New York Times. Can't you tell? Uh, so last year, I believe, yeah, uh, last year, her and her colleague um, successfully hacked a Linux-powered rifle uh, and got root on the rifle, which is a sentence I never thought I would say. <laughs> And with that root access to the rifle, we're able to change the targeting on the rifle so that, like, for example, if so somebody could hack your rifle and force you to accidentally shoot the wrong person, right? Um, this is a super fun hack, right? Obviously, um, like, pretty impactful and pretty bad if it were to happen in the wild, right? Through this, Runa might have saved some lives, right? If this had gone out and a terrorist had figured out how to hack this rifle, that could have been particularly bad, right? I think that this model might have been in consideration for use by either the US military or a different military. So this was a great story. Runa got a lot of press for it and got to talk about it a lot, right? It's, I mean, and it's a lot of fun, right? Who would have thought you could hack a rifle, right? If any of you like playing with guns and hacking, this is like the perfect way to scratch that itch, right? And this sort of falls under the category of what we call stunt hacking, right? Um, and there's a few examples of this. Stunt hacking is particularly fun. You get a lot of press, right? There's some discussion in the hacker community whether it's worthwhile, but nobody can argue that it doesn't make you famous, and nobody can argue that it's not fun. Uh, another example of stunt hacking, which you probably did hear of, were when these guys, Charlie Miller and Chris Valachek, hacked a Jeep that a reporter was driving on a major highway and completely took over the steering and brake and gas functionality of the Jeep while he was in the car. With his full knowledge and full consent, I should probably add. Um, so these guys are famous for car hacking. That was their most famous exploit, but they completely owned the Jeep, like, or in the Jeep sort of whole line of vehicles several times. Uh, caused a lot of trouble for that car company. They had to issue the largest recall of a car ever. I think it was something like, I don't know, in the millions of cars that they had to recall. So, I mean, and they got, they got a ton of news coverage, right? They pissed off the whoever, whatever company uh, is the parent company of Jeep, right? They had a fantastic time doing it, right? And like, who doesn't want to hack a car? Right? They took over steering of a car. And they were able to, and what they found was that all of these cars were accessible over the internet. So in theory, they could have taken over millions of cars, like they could have written a botnet to take over millions of cars and just slam the brakes on all of them at once, right? Or swerve them all right at once, right? Like crazy stuff like that. You want to protect national security? <laughs> like, yeah. that's a hell of a way to do it, right? Um, and it's a lot more fun than being those guys in that room in those cubicles that I showed you earlier, right? Um, oh yeah, okay, so bug bounty. So this is Katie Masaurus. Uh, she was, she previously worked at Microsoft uh, and now has founded her own company called Hacker One. She sets, so she set up the first corporate bug bounty program in Microsoft, and now HackerOne sets up bug bounties for other companies and even government agencies. What's a bug bounty? Bug bounties are a program where you get paid to find vulnerabilities in a company's website or network or software, right? So this is a great way to offensively hack not go to jail and still get paid, right? And Katie has made it possible for hackers to hack tons of companies and be paid pretty well for their efforts, uh, as long as you kind of comply with some basic rules 
and you know, contact the company beforehand and do it in good faith, right? If you really want to hack against a live target, right? If you want to find SQL injections and exploit code or exploit um, things, this is, this is a great way to do it. And Katie has really made that possible. So this is kind of another one of my hacker heroes, right? Like you can work to help keep hackers out of jail, right? She's done a lot to keep hackers out of jail and to get us paid and to get recognition for the work that we do. Oh my God, I think I might end early, George. This will be a first. Um, so there's a lot of really great work that we can do as hackers. Um, and I think it's really exciting, right? You can, there are a ton of nonprofits that need technological help. Most nonprofits don't even have a single member of IT staff, let alone a security person, let alone an entire security department, right? And nonprofits are doing important work all around the world and have, in some cases, uh, really serious adversaries, right? Um, so you can help those nonprofits and you can pick a cause that you care about, right? Pick a nonprofit that makes sense for you and that speaks to issues that you're concerned about, right? Think about who you are in your background and find a nonprofit that you think is doing really good work in your area and get involved, right? Contact them and say, hey, I am good with computers and I want to be able to help out, right? If you call up and say, hey, I want to hack your stuff, they might be a little freaked out, right? They might not understand what you mean there. So maybe, you know, approach them like an ursine mammal, right? Or a bear, if you will. Um, you know, carefully and slowly. But volunteering your time to a nonprofit and helping them, like giving them basic computer advice. And especially now, a lot of nonprofits just need basic security advice, right? Basic security hygiene. Right. Use good passwords, use a password manager, things like that. Right? These are great ways that you can help out. So pick a cause you care about and I urge you to do this. Pick a cause you care about and get involved. If after all this you are still dead set on working for the government, I mean that's great, go do it. But I urge you, if you see things, or if you're ordered to do things that are against your ethics, or that you think are immoral or undemocratic, I urge you to consider leaking that information. I urge you to consider blowing the whistle and telling people. We are always going to have hackers in the government, and it's important that some hackers go work for the government, but it's important that you keep the government honest and keep our government democratic and keep our government accountable to its people. It's extremely important that citizens be able to hold their government accountable. This is the foundation of democracy. And hackers can be the front lines of that. We're in fact in a unique position to do that. We have a lot of power, especially in this society. Security, information security, computer security is becoming extremely important, extremely important, has become extremely important. And certainly technological literacy has become extremely important and an important locus of power. And we have all of that power. We're kind of like superheroes. We're superheroes who hate flying skyscrapers, loud noises, direct sunlight. This is a, a cartoon that the guy who writes XKCD made for EFF. But it's true. Hackers are like superheroes. We have a ton of power. And we can use that power to keep other institutions of power, governments and corporations, in check. We can use that power to keep those other institutions accountable to the people that they serve. And if we're superheroes, then there's a quote from my favorite superhero that I think is very important here and very relevant to what we're talking about. Oh, it's not that. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> With great power comes great responsibility. And we should all keep that in mind, that we're hackers and we're powerful. Thank you very much. Five minutes for questions? No, we have time for questions. Yeah, great. So, yeah, questions? No, I just blew you all away. Here. <laughs> yeah? Um, if we wanted to learn about more uh, contemporary hacking, uh, what resources would you recommend? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, so, you mean like more examples of the things that I talked about here? Yeah, just like modern. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, that's an excellent question. So DEF CON is the largest hacker conference. It happens every year in Las Vegas. I think tickets are 150 bucks or something like that. Very accessible to students, right? Um, that's a, I mean, that's a great place to go learn about Modern hacking and DEF CON is so large now that it's almost a meta conference. There are like several smaller conferences now within DEF CON. So if there's a specific area of hacking that you're excited about, you can probably just go find a bunch of other people who are specifically excited about that, right? Um, and all of the people I mentioned will probably be there, right? So like if you wanted to hunt one of them down amongst the sea of a million other hackers, you probably could. Uh, Def, so yeah, DEF CON is a great place to go if you're interested in this sort of thing. As far as online, there's not like a good single source, right? I get a lot of my, uh, I get a lot of information through Twitter, right? A lot of like there's like InfoSec Twitter, right? Hacker Twitter. Um, uh, there's um, the EFF blog, Bruce Schneider's blog, um, the Intercept, and Wired. Right, those are all sort of great places to get news about major developments of this type. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, in your description of you know, not working for the government um, in, in terms of security and having, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of something like a Blackwater, where you have a private mercenary firm. So, yeah, you know, if you're not working for the government and we don't have some sort of form like this built into government, then isn't there a risk that, you know, you end up just with these private mercenary groups that don't have any sort of oversight? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and the question was, if you're not working for the government, isn't there sort of a risk that you end up working for these private mercenary groups like Blackwater that don't have any oversight? That's definitely true. And so Blackwater is a great example, again, of the industrial half of the military industrial complex that I am here urging you not to work for, right? Um, yeah, private mercenary groups, private intelligence companies, right? There's a ton of these, uh, Black Cube in Israel, Arcanum Intelligence in Kazakhstan, right? Or not in Kazakhstan. They're not in Kazakhstan. They worked for Kazakhstan. Um, right, yeah, these are all, they all, do the same things, and there's all the same reasons not to go work for them, right? You might not know who you're working on, your boss is probably a terrible person, right? You're probably doing things that are going to get people killed, and you need to think for yourself if you're okay with that, or you're probably working for autocratic or undemocratic regimes um, in other countries, right? So, yes, I very, just as much urge you to not go work for the Blackwaters or private intelligence companies of the world. But, but what is the institution, I mean, does CFF work or, or support any sort of institution? Once these things rise, what would be the defense? Who, who would we turn to as citizens who don't know how to hack to say, hey, how do we stop this private ah. group? So we turn to hackers. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so to sort of stop these, right, what's the defense against these groups? We as hackers need to help uh, everybody become more secure, become mm -hmm smarter and more literate about computer security and about information security because that's how we stop these groups, right? In, ter in terms of hacking, right? Obviously not in terms of military might, that's a different issue. But in terms of hacking, right, most of these groups use, you know, spear phishing or credential phishing attacks, right? Or use old 
you know, non-zero day, out of date exploits, right? And so by doing that sort of work, by bringing up the, you know, sort of tide, so to speak, of security as a whole, that's the way that we defend against these, you know, private mercenary companies, essentially. Is there a little war in the private private sector between, you know, for good guys and bad guys, the white hat, black hat sort of thing? Is that is that already happening? Mm. Or is that TV? Uh, that's that's more. The, yeah, I, I think uh, that's more TV, right? I mean, the the, the <coughs> information security industry is a large industry, and it's a very nebulous industry, right? The sort of white hat, black hat distinction, I don't think really applies anymore, right? I wrote this talk as a response to what I saw as the increasing influence of the military industrial complex on the information security industry, right? Um, like at RSA or at Black Hat, or some of these major InfoSec conferences, I saw a lot of booths sort of using this military jargon and appealing to sort of a military mindset, right? Even giving out like fake plastic cyber bullets. Right? And that's like, to, that to me is a perversion of what I love about hacking, right? Which is freedom and rebellion, right? And independence. And so that, that was sort of the locus for me that got me thinking about all of this in the first place. Yeah. Um, one of the ways to kind of scratch, uh, scratch that offensive um, itch, especially with students in the room, is like to capture the flag games. Oh, yeah, but so many capture the flag games have kind of turned into recruiting for the industrial uh, military complex. Like NSA has a code breaker challenge right. that they're appealing to students that if you do well, they'll send you a job offer or something. Yeah. But is there is there some games in particular that you like? I know. Um, ICTF is about to start in a month or so. Yeah, um, so that's an excellent point. And the, the uh, gentleman was talking about capture the flag games as a good way for to scratch the offensive hacking itch, especially for students. Um, but the you know also use of those in the military industrial complex. Um, and I completely agree. Uh, CTFs are a lot of fun. Uh, I've written a couple of CTFs. Uh, in fact, one of them might still be up at ctf.eff.org, although I make no guarantees. Um, but yeah, uh, so Capture the Flags, uh, for those who don't know, Capture the Flag is a sort of hacking challenge, right? Somebody puts together a series of <coughs> hacking puzzles, and you try to solve them or, you know, hack the various challenges and get points and, you know, beat it. You know, like find the flag in the challenge and get the points and get the most points in a certain amount of time, right? The biggest CTF in the world is at DEF CON. That's sort of like the um, World Cup of Capture the Flags, right? Um, but yeah, there's a lot of great ones online. I can't think of any specific examples off the top of my head. Uh, you mentioned ICTF. That's a good one. Uh, there's a CTF scoreboard I know online, and that's probably a good portal for finding other CTFs that are out there. Yeah, ctftime.org. Yeah, ctftime.org. That's it. Um, yeah, so that's you know there, there's a great number of Capture the Flags. Those are great ways to scratch that itch. Building a capture the flag is also a great way to scratch that itch because then you're trying to outsmart the other hackers by making your puzzle just hard enough that it's difficult but still fun and like eventually solvable. It's, it's a fun mental exercise. So yeah, CTS. Uh, anyone else? What's your opinion of anonymous? <laughs> What was the question? Uh, well, the, so the question was, what's my opinion of anonymous? Uh, <laughs> um, I don't think I want to answer that. <laughs> Why don't you want to answer? <laughs> Journalist, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, my opinions about anonymous are many and complicated, um, but I that you know, they, they shouldn't be thought of as one cohesive group, mm -hmm. right? It's a number of people. Anybody can be anonymous, you know, be capital A anonymous, right? And so to say what I think of anonymous, I fear would be treating them as one cohesive group. I think some of their actions are good examples of civil disobedience. I think that other of their actions were not so great. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's what I think of anonymous. Other questions? 
Okay? Thank you very much.